started. The home lab is like one of the best tools that you can have for two reasons. One, it helps you. It helps you to learn and it helps you to maybe do better in your job if you work in tech. And the second reason, it's just really cool that just benefits the people maybe that you live with. If you're living with people, if you're living with family, friends, whatever, or even if it's just you, right? You just wanna make a really cool smart home. You wanna secure your environment at home. You just wanna get nice integration, a home automation system. And what we're gonna talk about in this video is specifically the core. Switches, we're talking about servers. We're talking about all the storage bits. Like what are the bits themselves that sort of make up the foundations of your home life? If you love tech as much as I do, click on that subscription button as well. So that way you don't miss out on anything that we are doing. All right, let's start talking about this right now. now it really depends on where you're gonna be setting up this home lab and how you're gonna be setting up, whether you're gonna be using something like a cabinet rack behind me, whether you're sticking it in a closet or in the corner of a room, all of this needs to be connected to something that's gonna be managing all of it. And that could be something such as a router. It could be your home internet device, your router, which is configured with a firewall and perhaps a switch as well. And then you've got even things such as Wi-Fi that all need, all need to be considered when you are designing your home lab. At the end of the day, a lot of the decisions around what equipment you're gonna be using do come down to what you do want to be learning. If your focus is gonna be on servers, you wanna learn more about servers, you perhaps wanna learn about virtualization and things like that, maybe you wanna become a systems administrator, an engineer, an architect, then you're gonna focus, of course, your environment towards that. If you're wanting to work towards the maybe the networking and the security route, then you need to learn around the switching perspective, but also learn about routers, perhaps learn about security and all of the firewalls that come with it. So you really need to cater your environment to the tech that you want to learn about. Now, if you're doing this at home, if you're even doing this perhaps in a small business or even in a larger business, you've been given a space to actually set up your lab itself, well, you wanna have ideally some sort of an internet connection. Now you don't have to. Here's something you gotta consider. This is a home lab. So in some cases, you may actually purposefully want your home lab to be completely isolated from the internet. At the end of the day, you're gonna be installing a lot of infrastructure sorts of equipment and software and you know all of these sort of things that maybe you don't want to be able to have access to the internet or be able to have remote access coming in from the internet into your home lab environment. Sometimes you may want to. So for example, when you're needing to update some equipment, if you need to update the firmware or some software on a Windows server, the firmware on a switch, then sometimes you will require a internet connection. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to do anything. You'll have to download it manually on another computer, stick it on a USB stick, and then plug it into your lab if you need to that way. And that's completely fine. Another option as well is you can actually separate your network altogether from your home lab. So you can actually have your home lab set up, stick a router in it, and then have a main primary network, your production network, your home network, your business network with the router. And then you actually create a route from one to another, almost like a gateway in to your home lab so that your home lab isn't directly exposed to the internet. Rather, you connect maybe to like some sort of a jump box or a remote server or something on your production network. And then only that one server jumps, has access to your home lab. And that's the way that you get into it. And that's actually really, really good, especially if you're gonna be running some stuff that potentially could break a network. You really do have to consider that if you are doing this in a home, you may not have a massive impact, but if you've been given the opportunity to build some sort of a lab environment in a business, then you really do wanna keep this completely isolated from your production environment. Because what's gonna happen is you may actually decide to go and build a domain controller, build yourself your own domain running Active Directory, your own DNS server, your own firewalls with firewall rules. And the last thing that you want is for any of that to interfere with your actual production network. Now, if you are gonna be using your home lab network also for production, you're gonna be using it to host things out on your network, but also for internal learning, then you can do that. Like something that could be helpful, maybe you're off you know, remote, you're not at home, and you could still log in to your home lab from a remote site, for example. You could do that as well with relevant remote control software, and then you can still control it, still play with it, you know, play around with your lab, build things, destroy things, all of that, all remotely over the internet if you really needed to. 
So let's go back to the internet. So you could use your standard home internet if you do want to use it. Generally, your home internet provider, your ISP, may provide you a router as part of their bundle, and that router itself could actually be configured with some sort of a firewall internally, allowing you to create relevant firewall rules, relevant routes, relevant ports to be able to be opened or closed, access control lists, whitelists, websites that you can go to, blacklist websites that you cannot go to. So you can really do a lot of this stuff potentially on your home router. So you're also gonna to have to consider here is your home lab, do you want it to all be over ethernet, over cables, or do you also want it to be accessible over Wi-Fi? Are any of your devices gonna be Wi-Fi devices? A lot of these home routers have got so much smarts built into them. You can create routes, create different subnets, create even VLANing. You can do QoS, which is quality of service. You've got even firewall configurations in there. You can do port forwarding, you can do all this sort of stuff built into your own router. So if you wanna learn more around routing, around firewalls, have a look at the router that you've got. And if you've got that connected in some way or fashion to your home lab, then you can actually take advantage of a lot of that and actually send traffic to specific areas. Now, if you do really wanna get a little bit more enterprise, a little bit more corporate, then of course you can actually go and get yourself some more corporate routers, more corporate firewalls. You've got Cisco routers, like they're gonna be great. And then you can actually learn a lot physically having a big, rack mounted router same deal with firewalls there's a lot of vendors of firewalls cisco do some juniper do some there's the 40 gates there's palo alto there's a lot of big brands out there around specifically firewall technology now the other thing if you want to learn even more around firewalls but you don't have perhaps the money to get yourself some physical equipment a physical firewall then there are also software based firewalls out there now, one that I highly, highly recommend is one that is called PF Sense. PF Sense. Go and Google that, download it, and then set it up perhaps on a virtual server. All of the features that you need around a firewall, around a proxy, and all of that sort of filtering and security, you can actually do within PF Sense. So you don't have to go and necessarily spend the money getting the hardware. You could install PF Sense and then use that to create your own network, create your own firewall configurations, your proxies, if you wanna learn about proxies, then that's one that I highly, highly recommend. So a little bit here about switches, a device where a whole bunch of cables run into it. And of course, we've shown you some of the switches that I've got, where I've got more enterprise grade switches, right? The bigger ones, lots of ports. And then I've also got smaller switches with less ports. Switches will gonna come in different sorts of configurations, different speeds. 10 by 100 by 1000, you can get 10 gigabit, you can get lots of different sorts of configurations. You've also then got dumb switches and then managed switches as well. And the difference is here being that a dumb switch would be you go down to your local PC store and you buy yourself maybe a five port or an eight port switch. You plug in all the cables to all your devices and it just works and that's great. And that's really what a switch is meant to do. That is its primary purpose is to route the traffic and pass the traffic, the packets and all of that between all of your devices. A managed switch is that on steroids. Now it allows you to actually go in and manage the switch. It has its own managing interface, an interface that you can log in, a console that you can log in, you can access that switch on the network, and then you can go and get a little bit more fancy by configuring the ports on that switch. You can say the speed of the port or the VLAN or the subnet that that port needs to be on. So you can get very, very smart with a managed switch. Now in a home lab environment, completely optional what switch you're gonna go for. If you just wanna hook everything up together, then some standard unmanaged switches will probably be enough. You just wanna get everything working and on the network, that is fine. But if you have a goal to learn more about networking, then I recommend going and getting equipment that is managed switch. And then you can get very fancy, get multiple switches to do different sorts of things. The great thing about a switch, of course, is that you can actually specify what these ports will do and what these ports will do. These ports are maybe just for my server traffic. These ports are gonna be for my network traffic for my computers, for example. Now, at the end of the day, any computer could act as a server. Now you've got server hardware that is sort of being customized and catered specifically for a server. But ultimately, if you've got a computer, you can install Windows Server 
onto it. You could go and download Ubuntu, which is a Linux flavor of, uh, of, of an operating system. Ubuntu server, and then it becomes a server. Some software called VMware to create a hypervisor, a virtualization environment, and that makes a computer into a server. So whether you've got a laptop or a desktop, you can ultimately start learning about servers just by installing the equipment, the right software onto that equipment, and then make it into a server. Now, of course, if you want to get the best out of a server, then using a physical server is going to be the best for you because a physical server is bigger and it contains a lot more grunt. It contains better CPU, more RAM, potentially more hard drives as well. And it has redundant power, a lot more fans, and it's just a lot more enterprisey. So especially if you're wanting to learn about physical servers, how to rack them, how to set them up, how to configure them, how to troubleshoot them. Even if you have a desktop, even if you have a laptop, an old desktop, an old laptop, they can form part of your home lab and you can also install server software onto them. Now, of course, the only other negative about a physical server, especially if you're looking at something like a rack server, is that they are big, they are noisy, and they get really, really hot. So if you're looking at building a home lab that's gonna be a little bit more quiet, then perhaps a physical server is not right for you. And additionally, you need to store that thing somewhere. If you don't have something like a cabinet, like a rack cabinet, like what I've got, then a physical server, you wanna just sort of sit that on a table, on a, on a shelf, it's a big piece of hardware. In my environment, for my home lab, I'm running VMware, which is your virtualization technology. They're converting these computers into what's called a hypervisor. And then I can build a whole bunch of virtual machines directly on those computers. Potentially one, two, three, 10, 20, 30 virtual machines. So 30 computers, 30 servers running on one physical computer. In a rack server, you could potentially build a lot more and have them all running at the same time because you've got the CPU and the RAM to be able to provide the grunt that's needed to be able to run all these virtual machines at the same time. If you're gonna be doing this on a desktop or on a laptop, like some of the ones that I've got, then you may not be able to do that. You could potentially build yourself a huge virtualization environment, maybe 20 VMs, and have them all hosted on your desktop computer or your laptop, for example, but you're probably not gonna be able to have them all running at the same time. You're gonna be allocating virtual RAM, virtual CPUs to these virtual machines, and because you don't have the physical RAM and the physical CPU to be able to provide these virtual versions of this, you're not gonna be able to run them all at the same time and with the same amount of grunt as you may be able to with a rack server. Even if you've got computers that are a little bit older, a few years old, and they're no longer being used, don't throw them out because you can use them as part of your lab. But if you do wanna learn a little bit about racks, then go and look on eBay. Go and look at secondhand places that sell stuff. Some people give them away for almost nothing. Companies who perhaps upgrade, you know, they wanna get rid of their old Dell, uh, their old Dell PowerEdge server. They may want to upgrade to something a little bit better. So they'll sell their old one for maybe like 50 bucks. And then you're great because you've just scored yourself a bargain on a enterprise grade server. It won't be as powerful as something that is modern and new that costs thousands and thousands of dollars, but you've at least then got yourself a rack server that will be better than you using a desktop or a laptop. So once you've got all this equipment and you're gonna set it up, whether it's in a server rack cabinet like what I've got, or whether you wanna be doing it in your own little closet, wherever that may be, you then start building your environment from there. And of course, whatever you're gonna be setting up, you want to be catering it to what you want to be learning more about. Your lab is about you learning, just playing around with things, building things, destroying things, learning how they work. So you go and build your lab to that spec. You wanna learn about virtualization, you wanna learn about Windows servers, Linux servers, you wanna learn about DNS, DHCP, domain controllers, Active Directory, then you're gonna to need to get yourself service configured, and then you can really go and build VMs catered to your specific learning. So that's a little bit about physical servers and some of the stuff that you could be learning about. Another big component that you could use in a home lab is a storage device, a storage network. Now, you may commonly be using USB drives. You've got a whole bunch of USB sticks, USB drives, USB hard drives that you're plugging into all of your devices. And that's where you store all of your software, you install the operating systems all from a USB drive. 
But it's very common that in the enterprise world, in the corporate environment, you have storage networks, storage devices. SAN and NAS are the two most common ones that are out there. Storage area network and a network attached storage. Essentially big devices that contain a whole bunch of disks. So you can stick two and a half inch, three and a half inch disks inside of these devices and they are storage networks. So essentially they're storage devices that are accessible on the network. So you can actually store all of the data, the virtual machines, all of the operating systems, all inside of these devices and then they can be shared across the devices on your network so that any of your servers, any of the equipment that you've got on your network can potentially access the data that is stored on these storage area networks. Now for my particular home lab right here, I've got a few devices. I've got a couple of Synology storage devices, a smaller one and a larger one. These can come in small, compact size, which is more for a desktop environment. It could be potentially for a smaller home lab. In the enterprise world, you may find something larger, which is more rack-based, very similar to a server, which is a rack-based server. You can also get storage devices, which are rack-based storage devices that will slot inside of a server rack. And that's essentially what's providing all of the storage, all of the data for the network. So what you're gonna find is very common is if you're gonna build yourself some physical servers, right? Let's say you've got a server, whether that be a desktop or laptop or an actual rack server that is installed with server software. Well, once you install that server software, let's say you're installing something like VMware, ESXi, you're building a whole bunch of virtual machines. Well, these virtual machines need to sit somewhere. So unless you have a storage device, then those virtual machines need to sit on the actual server that you are building. And that may sound really, really good, but if you're gonna be setting up an environment where you have the ability to move virtual machines around or share storage, then you're sort of limited because you've only got the capacity that is on that computer, and you're not gonna be able to move those VMs, those virtual machines from one server, one computer to another one quite easily. So what is the solution to this? Well, then you've got the storage network. So on those storage networks, whole bunch of disks, you can expand it, you can make it bigger, you can add additional disks, you can set up RAID configuration so that there's elements of redundancy, so if a disk fails, you don't actually lose any of your data. And that is where you actually store all of the virtual machines and the server software within your home lab. So then every device on your network can access those virtual machines that are sitting within your home lab. So it just centralizes all of the data that is sitting on your network. You could buy something like a two bay or a four bay or a five bay or even something significantly bigger. Of course, the bigger device you buy, the bit more costly it's going to be and they're generally gonna be coming empty. So you'll have to go and buy the hard drives, two and a half inch, three and a half inch. You could buy SAS, you could buy SATA, you could buy flash disks inside of them. Obviously the flash would be significantly faster than the other ones, but there's gonna come in different configurations. So you can go consider maybe buying either a brand new one or you can get yourself a secondhand one for not too expensive. But I'd recommend looking into it, especially if you're going to want to install a lot of stuff within your lab environment, because the more storage you've got, the more virtual machines and the more learning that you can do. So this is the foundational stuff, the core stuff, the stuff that you need to make just the home lab work. But ultimately the best thing about this is this is where you can now build the home lab that uh, you want to build. Don't copy what I've built. Buy stuff if you've got a bit of cash laying around, secondhand stuff, go, you know, Facebook Marketplace, 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 eBay, Places like this, you'll be able to find some pretty cheap stuff. And say, hey friend, hey family, can I have some of your old stuff that you're no longer using? And then you repurpose that for your home lab. Thanks so much for tuning in. Subscribe as well, click on the button on the bell. We, we release videos on all things tech. So if you like tech, do that thing as well so that you don't miss out on anything. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next video.